open with me to the book of Haggai, the Old Testament book of Haggai, chapter 1. Please know I am cognizant of the time. I know some of y'all put us on a real hard time, but it don't start till you get here. Then you'll rush me. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Devron, don't laugh. You laugh, it makes me feel like I'm being petty. I'm not. <laughs> Haggai chapter 1. I've got no intention to be before you longer than I need to be. Amen. <laughs> Somebody's like, well, how long is that? <laughs> I'm reading from the New Living Translation, beginning at verse 1, Haggai, chapter 1, beginning at verse 1. On August 29th of the second year of King Darius's reign, the Lord gave a message through the prophet Haggai to Zerubbabel, son of Shealtiel, governor of Judah, and to Jeshua, son of Jehozadak, the high priest. This is what the Lord of heaven's armies says. The people are saying, the time has not yet come to rebuild the house of the Lord. Then the Lord sent this message through the prophet Haggai. Why are you living in luxurious houses while my house lies in ruins? This is what the Lord of heaven's armies says. Look at what's happening to you. You have planted much, but harvest little. You eat, but are not satisfied. You drink, but are still thirsty. You put on clothes, but cannot keep warm. Your wages disappear as though you were putting them in pockets filled with holes. This is what the Lord of Heaven's army says. Look at what's happening to you. Now, go up into the hills, bring down timber, and rebuild my house. Then I will take pleasure in it and be honored, says the Lord. We'll stop right there. I want to talk this morning for a little more, a little while on establishing priorities. Establishing priorities. The word of the Lord is blessed. Please be seated in the presence of the Lord. I want to begin by asking what is, I believe, a very most relevant question, and that is simply this. Where does God really fit in your life? Where does God really fit? in your life. It needs to be that we understand wholeheartedly that God must occupy a place of preeminence and priority in our lives. As a principle, to make something a priority, it means doing first things first. As a process, it means evaluating a group of items and ranking them in order of importance or urgency. Pascal, the French mathematician and theologian, once said, the last thing one knows is what to put first. I believe one of the most common problems among the people of God is simply misplaced emphasis. When you, are, uh, when you have things in its proper priority, it ensures that resources are allocated properly to the areas or the items that need them the most. Unfortunately for too many of us, God does not occupy a place of priority in, his, in our lives. We misplace the emphasis and put it on a lot of good things, but not on the God thing. As a matter of fact, you'll know most of us know how to make God a priority, Apostle Donaldson, because the moment we are in trouble, God becomes the number one most important person to us. The moment we don't have all the money we have, God becomes number one. The moment we get bad news from the doctor, God becomes number one. The moment our spouses do things that we don't like, our God becomes number one. And unfortunately, that's a bad way to live your life because God must possess the same priority all of the time. 
in your life. If God's number one when you are in danger, he should be number one when you are in delight. If God is number one when you are going through hell, he should be number one when you are happy. If we are honestly to be people of God, you and I must be people who have established priorities. The year is 536 B.C., it is a time of joy for the exiled Israelites in Babylon. The nation had been out of its land for some 70 years, and the decree has just been made by the Persian king Cyrus that Israel must return to its homeland, particularly Jerusalem, and they must build the temple. Though only about 50,000 Jews, Jews accept the king's offer, they set out enthusiastically to do the holy work that is before them. However, in less than a year, opposition from the neighboring Samaritans and pressure from the Persian government put an end to the construction project. The priorities of the Jewish people drastically change and the partially rebuilt temple goes unfinished for the next 16 years. Hear this. God has just brought them out and they spend less than a year focused on him and 16 years in consistent and constant ignorance of what God wants to happen. Now, I'm careful to point out that this text teaches us specifically how God desires, desired for his people to physically rebuild the temple. The years of exile and abandonment, partial destruction from the capturing armies have left God's house decimated. Very little remains of it. And God wants the people to rebuild the temple and in so doing, Keith, reestablish the priority of worship in the life of the people. It's no different for us today. The reference of the temple, of God's house, is the call upon us all to establish the priority of worship and what things belong to God. Back to its rightful place as the number one, somebody shout number one, the number one priority of our lives. So now we arrive at this point in our text. God is displeased. Brother Sistrunk, God summons the prophet Haggai to deliver a message to the people. But before he gives them his message, Lady Kim, he tells them, I've already gotten yours. Look at verse 2 in the text. This is what the Lord says. The Lord says, the people say, the time has not yet come to rebuild the house of the Lord. Please don't miss this. The message Israel gives to the Lord, he wants them to know, you are telling me very clearly it is not time to focus on the things of God. Not only have you spoken it directly, but how you have spent your time. Deaconess George has shown and proven that you feel the time is not right now for you to rebuild the house of God. The time is not right now for you to incorporate worship as a priority. The time is not right now in order for God to have the place of preeminence in our lives. You've allowed yourselves to become distracted from the work of temple building. And you've used the same time to focus on what was really important to you. It was definitely time to build. But what you didn't want to do was build my house. You wanted to build yours. Okay, let me. And so, so the question is, what time is it for the Israelites? My time. That's been your response. And God says in verse 2, I hear you loud and clear. It wasn't that it was not time to build. It's just that you didn't want to spend the time building what belonged to me. You didn't want to spend the time making me a priority and that's the worst lesson that I think we need to get this morning and that is that time is the first way we show what's really a priority right. are you hearing me saints in the King James Version verse 3 has God asking is it time 
for you. You say it's not my time, but is it time for you? Let me ask you this question. You already don't like me, so let me go ahead and push the gas. What gets the majority of your time? I'll wait. Let you think about it. What really gets the majority of your time? You know, time is like money. It shows us where our heart is. If we looked at your bank account, we could tell what's important to you. Some of you, lunch is important to you. Because the bank account shows that transactions occur between 11 and 2. You know, it put a little time on that, Dwight. You know, it does. They'll tell you, Channing, what, what time you swiped. You understand. Uh-huh. If, if we looked at the bank account, we could tell, you know, what the favorite stores are. Uh-huh. We would know what was important to you by your money. But now if we followed you for a day, your time would say what's really important. That doggone Apple thought they was doing something to help me. They thought. It's not helping me like I think they wanted it to. But every weekend, Sunday morning, unfortunately, they tell me how much time I've spent on my phone. Yes, they do. They tell me exactly how much time I've spent on my phone. And that ain't enough for them, Veronica. They tell me how much time I've spent on each app. They do. They'll break it down for you. They give you charts and graphs. Have you not noticed this? Huh? They'll tell you exactly. And I'll never forget one week I looked at it and I really paid attention to it, Elder Hill, and I couldn't find the Bible app nowhere. I'm like, well, wait, wait a minute. You telling me I ain't looked at the Bible this week at all? Oh, it was on my iPad. It was on my iPad. That was my excuse. It was really an uncomfortable thing, but it showed me that at least for that week where my heart was. Can we, can we investigate your daily routine? What will it tell us is the most important thing to you? Not only has your time not been well spent, but you've also made yourself the top priority. This is what the Lord is saying to them. Verse 4, he says, you are living in luxurious houses. You, you didn't build something just to get by. You went above and beyond. You made it luxurious. You made it comfortable. You made it convenient. You made it the way you like it because you were the top priority. You made you number one. So now we got a problem, people of God. When you look at your own life, you have to deal with the truth and determine if what you have done, where you have put your time, where you have given emphasis, where you spend your money, does it all revolve around you? Are you your top priority. Let me tell you how you'll know when you consider all of your energy and resources. If it was done to make you feel good, you're the top priority. If it was done to make you look good, you're the top priority. If it was done to make you more comfortable, if it was done to make you feel more included, if it was done to make you feel more envied, done to make you more marketable, done to make you more beautiful, done to make you more notable, that means you are your own top priority and that's not the position you or I are supposed to be in that's supposed to be God's space and when God is not in his space in our lives then nothing you do is going to be as fulfilling as it could be are you hearing me this morning I'm almost done won't you believe it watch this look at verse 6 he tells us when I'm not in the right place Nothing works like it's supposed to. Look at the text. You plant much and bring in little. You eat and can't get satisfied. You drink, but you're still thirsty. You get dressed and you can't get warm. You work, get paid, but it's like you put your money in a purse with holes in it. Wallet leaks it out. And this is the reason why. God says, you've got me in the wrong space. It's not that what you have done is inherently bad. It's just that you had it out of priority. You didn't make God first. Here's Matthew chapter 6. He tells us what the priority is supposed to be. Seek first God's house 
the kingdom of God, his way, his priority, his way of doing things. And when you have done that, everything else gets added. Not only does it fall into line, but it actually becomes more fulfilling when it's in its proper place. And so for you and I, we've got to establish priorities. God thinks a lot of himself because he tells us, put me first. And when I am first, everything else will have fulfillment. When I am first, your effort will actually be worth more. When I am first, you won't have to wonder why things are not moving in your life like it should. And I know the question is asked, well, I know a lot of people who are successful. I know a lot of people who are prosperous. I know a lot of people who are doing things they want to do, and they have not put God first. Please hear me when I tell you, God's command is first to the people who said he was their God. It's, it applies to us that have said, God is my God. That he has to ensure that we give him the right space, the right emphasis, the right priority. Because if we don't, it works against us in our lives. It would be better if you didn't believe in him than to believe in him and not put him first. It'd be better for you to worship Buddha than to worship God when you want to. He's got to be the number one priority because if he is not, none of your stuff works. And so the challenge this morning, very simply, is for us to establish the priority. And the priority puts God first. Can the church say amen? amen. That's my Presbyterian sermon. Please stand. I hollered during communion. It's time to go. Hear me. God's got an expectation. He expects. Y'all look like y'all mad. He expects that he's going to be number one. Here, here's what's interesting. God not only wants to be number one, he doesn't do any other position well. Did, did you hear me? God says, if I'm not number one, I'm not playing number two. God forbid you make me number three. And for those of us that know him, for those of us that call on him, it's our responsibility to ensure that he is number one. This morning, there's a challenge for some of us to ensure he's number one by giving our lives to him. Some have been living your life and you have been your number one priority. Everything about your life today says, I'm the most important thing. You make time to ensure that your hair gets done that your clothes are right that you do what you want to do on your job and yet God maybe maybe you are on time for everything else in your life but God maybe you have robbed Peter to pay Paul. But you robbed God to take care of everybody else. What's the real priority? Who's the most important one in your life? How is your time allocated? This is the challenge that he puts before us. And if you know that he's supposed to be number one and you've not given your life to him, he says to you, I can't be number two. I'm a jealous God. That's what his word declares. So if you're here and you don't have a relationship with Jesus Christ, you should make that priority. Number one. Maybe you're here and you've given your life to Christ, but you've walked away. You've gotten distracted. 
like the children of Israel, you've had more time away from God than you have had with him, and you want to return.